victory over sin. Amen. All right. We welcome those that are watching, just joined us by Facebook. We thank God for you for joining us on this morning, Partakers Church of Christ Ministries, where our pastor is Pastor First Lady, our Pastor Michael J. Isaac and First Lady Angela Isaac. We give God glory for you joining us this morning. We know there's so many social media sites that you could have joined for Sunday morning. We thank God for you. Uh, our lesson today, if you would like to turn your Bibles, uh, you can do so and kind of read along with us in scripture. And if you like to join us actually in the Zoom classroom, you can do so. If you're on those partakers pages, just go to events and go to Sunday school and click on the link and it will bring you into the classroom and you can be a part of the discussion. Uh, we would love to hear uh, your, your, what, you know anything that you have to share in reference to the lesson. And uh, the title of our lesson is Crucifixion and Death. And the lesson text is coming from John chapter 19, 16 through 30. Amen. And we just read out today's aim. And um, I'm going to read our introduction. Capital punishment has long been debated by both the church and society. Some nations have outlawed it altogether. Others carry out executions capriciously not unlike what happened in biblical times. The execution of lawbreakers is clearly commanded under the Mosaic law. Some Christians, however, believe that we have no such mandate under the new covenant. Capital punishment is strictly uh, per, per, per prerogative in the civil authorities, not individuals. No one has the right to personally carry out a death sentence on his own. The first century Roman legal system had no prison system as we think of it. Incarceration normally was the, the relatively short time prior to trial or execution. The death sentence was the, the often imposed for crimes not considered capital offenses anywhere today. And that is really a touchy subject when it comes to uh, today uh, in our time far as capital punishment. And again, it, as it stated, no one has to write individually to take a person's life on their own. That is up to the civil authorities to, uh, to decide those measures, amen. All right, so our lesson outline is, we have four outlines today, uh, Christ crucifixion, John 19, 16 through 22, and outline number two, prophecy fulfilled, John 19, 23 through 24, and outline number three, provision arranged, and that's John 19, 25 through 27, and outline number four, mission accomplished, and that's John 19, 28 through 30. Amen. Let me see. We one, two, three. We got about enough people. If I can get everybody to read three verses. We're going to start with um, Alicia. Sister Alicia, are you able to read the verse today? Yes. Okay. Thank the Lord. All right. If you want to read uh, the first three verses for us, and Deacon Edwards, if you can read the next three, and Missionary Pat, the next three, and I'll finish off the last. I mean, Mother, Mother Melton, I said you right, Mother. No, you said Pat. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you, if you could, um, I think so. You read three and then I'll read three. I thought I, I thought the numbers looked kind of funny at first when I said that. Okay. John 19, 16. Then deliver he him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew, Golgotha 18, where they crucified him and two other with him on either side, one and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the, this title then read many of the Jews. 
for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and, and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priest of the Jews to, to Pilate, write not the king of the Jews, but what he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Um, then the soldiers, they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier a part and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it. Though woes it, I'm sorry, whose it shall be that the scripture might be fulfilled with which saith, they parted, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciples, be the disciple, behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it unto his and put it put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Amen. All right. Really good lesson for today. Uh, some eye openers uh, in some of the reading. Um, so I want to jump right into it and let's see if we can get through the uh, entire lesson today. So our first outline, Christ crucified. If we can get someone to read that portion. Pilate tried to release Jesus, but the religious leaders insinuated that such an action would be tantamount to treason against Caesar. Pilate did not want to be perceived as treasonous, so he relented giving the order for Jesus to be crucified. Suffering the cross, the place of execution was known as Golgotha or Calvary. Both words mean skull. Two criminals were also crucified along with Jesus, fulfilling Isaiah in 12. He made his grave with the wicked and he was numbered with the transgressors. Oh, did I go too far? Um, yeah, a little bit, but that's okay. That's fine. Okay, okay. Sorry. Okay, you have anything you want to share? Anyone? Um, it sounds like he's saying he made his bed, so now he got to lay in it. Along with the others that did the same. Well, we know that that uh, it's like it mentioned. Um, I think the two criminals that were also crucified along with Jesus fulfilled Isaiah's Isaiah, like you said, fifty three and nine and twelve. He made his grave with the wicked, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Now, he it, that's in a sense he's just saying that you know. Uh, he chose to to go to the cross. It wasn't he didn't do the same thing that they did to deserve the punishment that the the uh, two criminals cr criminals did, or those as Isaiah said uh, that they um, 
the numbers, uh, he, he was numbered with the transgressors. So he was numbered with the transgressors because he took on our transgressions, uh, not because of his own transgressions, because he had none. Um, but that was uh, um, what Isaiah was talking about in a sense. Now the place, any, anybody else have any, anything they want to add? Yes, yeah, so like on the first part, when it was talking about Pilate wanted to release Jesus because mm -hmm. they know he, did, he didn't do anything wrong. You know, when he yeah. was asking, you know, uh, you know, they wanted to, they wanted uh, Jesus crucified. I mean, they wanted him killed, but Pilate wanted to release because they, you know, as, as the questioner, he showed that he didn't do that he didn't do anything wrong. But they went with the Jews because they didn't want to look like they was going against them. You know, their policy. You know, because you know he didn't want to seem like they was like they were treason. They was going, you know, with treason when you're going against somebody and who I guess in this same realm. Yeah, um, you know, Pilate was trying to keep the peace, you know, and sometimes trying to keep the peace ain't always the best thing uh, when it comes to certain situations. Sometimes, some you know, you have to stand up and, and uh, let your voice be heard, especially when there's wrongdoing. Pilate knew that they, there was no reason for uh, or, or anything that they could do or that they brought Jesus to him to to uh, basically wanted him put to death to be crucified, but he didn't have just cause. So in order to keep the peace, he just he went on and allowed it to take place. So um, I knew I had uh, I knew it wasn't Jesus, you know, that committed those crimes. But it was talking about the two criminals. That's what I was referring to. But it was all, of course, <laughs> my apologies. That's okay. I know what you was trying to say. Um, um, but yeah, uh, sometimes again, you know, being a peacemaker, uh, you know, in that situation is not the best thing. He should have, he should have released Jesus, but for the scriptures to be fulfilled, he had to go along. Of course, you know, he didn't have any knowledge that he was fulfilling scripture. Mm -hmm. so, um, but again, that's the way uh, God had planned it. Um, but the thing is, you know, here, you know, when Jesus came on the scene, uh, the one thing that uh, the Jewish uh, people, those that were followers of him, they wanted them to, to dethrone the, the, the uh, Roman government. But then they turned around here and said, hey, we have no king but Caesar. <laughs> you know, so uh, it's, it's funny how they flip flop. Um, I know the lesson in one part of the lesson that talked about how, you know, they did the trial for every entry and they were praising them, you know, on the way in and then yelling crucify him at the end, by the end of the week. Um, but uh, just goes to show you uh, how, how people are. Um, all right. Suffering the cross. We read that. Uh, any, any questions about the place of the skull, the place of the skull or Golgotha? And actually, uh, one thing that stood out says one purported location for the sites of Jesus' execution actually, actually does resemble a skull to this day. Has anybody seen that before? On TV when they did the um, crucifixion on TV. Yeah. Um, if you Google some pictures of that, you can see, you know, the resemblance somewhat. So I thought that was very interesting. Okay. Um, various forms of crucifixion are known to, to have ex existed in ancient times. Some prisoners were tied to, to the tied to crosses and allowed to die of exposure. Uh, they, they had, you know, the Romans kind of, from what they said about this, they didn't invent the crucifixion. They just perfected it. Uh, and that was something that was interesting about to me. All right, we're going to go on to the next part of the outline. Inscription controversy. Since crucifixions were carried out in public, a placard was often placed on the cross of the condemned person to identify the criminal and the crime for which he was being executed. This was usually for inspiring fear in the populace rather than for merely informational purpose. Since the Jewish leaders had 
convinced Pilate to execute Jesus because he claimed to be the king of the Jews, Pilate had that title inscribed on his cross so that it, anyone would be able to understand what was written. The inscription was presented in three languages, Arab, Ar Aramic, that's the language spoken by most Jews at this time, usually known as Hebrew to Greeks and Romans, Latin, the official language of the Roman Empire, and Greek, the universal language of the known world at this time and used by the writers of the New Testament. The chief priests were highly indignant about this inscription. They wanted Pilate to change the message to say that Jesus only claimed to be the king of the Jews, but Pilate was no longer in a mood to accommodate the Jewish leaders. So he refused to give their request any consideration. He told them brus briskly, what I have written, I have written. Right. Well, yeah, what this is saying about the inscription on the cross, it, I guess it says it wasn't mainly for uh, information of purposes, but I guess it's as different ones would see it or read it on the cross, maybe it would uh, bring some type of fear to them being that they, uh, they knew, I mean, personally, they knew who Jesus was, but of course they tried to um, deny that he was the king of the Jews. But uh, like Pilate said, Jesus claimed to be the king of the Jews. So this is what Pilate had written on there. It's just what Jesus said. And um, personally, Pilate did believe that he was king of the Jews. This is why he says, what I have written, I have written. Yeah. And, and not only that, uh, that's what the Pharisees said. They said, hey, he claimed, Jesus, is, Jesus claimed was to be, claimed that he was the king of the Jews. But however, um, you know, that was, as I stated, that's what the, the, the crime that person committed, as they say, would, would be placed upon, would be inscribed on this plaque, this placard. Um, and, and that was what they said, why, did he, why was he crucified? I mean, we know that, you know, he, he died for our sins, but the purpose, their purpose was because what he claimed to be, which they felt was a crime, you know, uh, was an abomination. Because if we go back to the lesson last week, when it talked about if the Roman government was not in charge at the time, if they wasn't uh, ruling uh, over Jerusalem, then guess what they would have did? They would have stoned Jesus to death. But since the Romans were in charge, the, the, the Jews, you know, they could not do anything. The, uh, the Pharisees, Sadducees, they couldn't do anything because they wanted a different government. So they had to, they had to, uh, to go to Caesar and, and Herod to try to get them to, uh, to take these acts against Jesus. So in a sense, that was the crime that they felt that he, he committed, um, which was, you know, again, what, what the scriptures was talking about. And Pilate, to the point, he had enough. Enough is enough. Yeah, we, you know, he knew he, he, he uh, you know, took these acts against an innocent man. And here they are trying to, you know, you know, trying to get him to, to change what he had written. Like he said, hey, what I written, I written. This is what I heard. You know, y'all claimed it. He claimed it. So any questions, any comments, anybody else? None? All right, we're gonna move on again to the next outline. Uh, prophecy fulfilled. We can get somebody to read that portion. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes Elder. My phone, sorry. It was common practice at this time for those on the death details to simply divide the clothing and other personal possessions of the condiment among themselves. 
the condemn, the condemned were usually crucified naked, adding to their public humiliation. humiliation. There were four soldiers at the cross, so most of Jesus' clothes was parceled out among them in four ways, but they were still left with Jesus' coat or tunic, which was woven in one piece and no seams. Rather than tear the garment into four ruined rags, the soldiers decided to gamble to see who could get the whole garment. Specifically, how they did this is not stated, but it probably involved something like the rolling of dice. Like many other seemingly ordinary actions surrounding Jesus' life and death, what the soldiers did unintentionally fulfilled prophecy. The original prophecy is from Psalms 22, 18, and Psalms 22 is a um, Masonic Psalms. Though it was written by David about a thousand years earlier concerning events of his own life, the psalm famously contained numerous compelling parallels to Christ's suffering on the cross. <clears throat> I guess the one thing that stuck out with me was um, the type of garment or his coat that he had worn where it had no seams on it. So um, that was the part where, it, you know, I looked at is that they weren't able to rip it in four parts and um, you know that because if they had tore it, it it wouldn't have been equally four squares so when they departed the raiments among them as the scripture says um, the vesters did not cast they did not cast lots things mm -hmm. these things before the soldiers did so um, that's one thing that stuck out for me yeah, I was I was thinking, um, and I was going to ask Mother Melton since she's you know good with sewing and and things like that, kind of kind of help us understand because I'm thinking of a seamless garment, like I said, it was woven. So uh, you know, and I and I was thinking more so that it was unique in its way because it was woven. Is that's why they didn't want to tear it because of the uniqueness of it, and that's why they cast it lots for it because. Uh, it was unique. It was different. They haven't they haven't seen anything like you know normally like that. So um, it's something that was uh, very unique in a sense. And I was going to ask them because she she, she she sews and all that stuff. When it says seamless, that means it's, it wasn't sewn. There was no pieces. There was no parts of it sewn together to make the clothes. To me, uh, something that's woven is more like something that's uh, knitted. Mm -hmm. You you can't cut something that's knitted because it will just you know it will it would just un unravel mm -hmm. so there would be no parts i mean there's no way you can cut uh, something knitted because it, it just don't work yeah. they cut and, and it seemed, um uh -huh. seemed and it was easy to rip right right yeah, yeah like uh well, I don't knit, but I have crochet, but usually you start in a little circle and you go round and round and round and round and round and round and you don't have a seam. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. It gives you know a little better understanding to me. I know it does, because I know I I've seen her cro crochet before. I ain't know, you know, and uh, you know, she used to make us hats and stuff and skulls, so. <laughs> but anyway, um, that's what kind of stood out to me too. I think I thought it was the uniqueness of it is one of the reasons why they, and by not having any seams is the reason why they didn't want to, to, to tear it. Mm -hmm. All right, any, any other comments? Any other questions? Alicia said to make cloth by interfacing the threads of the weft and the raft, the wrap, the warp, the warp on the on the loom. Um, the interface threads. I'm really, uh, really, you probably could say that better than I can read it. <laughs> <laughs> if you want, that. but she <laughs> those that want to read it. So uh, unfortunately, those on Facebook can't see it. But yeah, that's quite a bit. But um, that's it. Huh? 
That's a knit. Anytime mm -hmm. you do something on a loom, it's a knit. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that stood out to me was, uh, it said, uh, you know, how they crucified the men. And it says that the, uh, the condemned were usually crucified naked, adding their public humiliation. So we've seen movies and we've seen pictures and we've seen statues with Jesus where, uh, you know, these statues of, uh, of what they say is Jesus, where he had his uh, private parts covered. Um, again, according to scripture, that was, we want to stick to the common thing, the common, they normally did that and they were, they were naked. That was part of the humiliation part of it. So, um, but again, you know, that's totally different from what we see on the crucifix and what we see on TV. Um, so we, we we have to you know kind of understand what Jesus went through um, you know um, or or not say pretty much not that we can understand it but we can you know at least get a a proper picture in a sense uh, of part of what he went through uh, during that crucifixion that time of crucifixion you know I think the uh, the um, the passion showed a, a good example you know it was really a bloody movie a bloody scene but you know that can't depict actually what jesus went through um but uh again the public humiliation part uh where they these men these the people that were condemned or that were crucified they were naked all right if there'd be no more questions no more comments uh, um i just wanted to say that i had read a part in the commentary about the garment um it said that the um the point is not whether or not Jesus' coat or tunic was valuable. Um, the point was to show how deep Jesus' humiliation was when everything was taken from him while he offered himself for um, sin of the world. I just want to share that. Okay. All right. We're going to go on to the next part of the outline, um, provision arranged. If we can get someone to read that part, uh, John 20, uh, 19, 25 through 27. While the chosen follower largely forsook Jesus after his arrest, there were some disciples who remained faithful during that time. Among them were certain women who stood near his cross. Jesus' own mother, Mary, stood there. The dis disciple whom Jesus loved has traditionally been understood as a reference to the author of the fourth gospel, the gospel, I mean, the apostle John himself. When Jesus said to Mary, behold thy son, he was telling her she should now think of John as her son. He would be taking his place. Then when he, when he said to John, behold thy mother, he was likewise telling John he, he should now consider Mary his mother. It was a measure whereby Jesus could be assured that Mary would be cared for. And uh, when I'm getting out of this, even in his death, he was showing you know, that he cared for others, making sure that people was taken care of, you know, as he was getting ready you know, to know uh, 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 to make the ultimate sacrifice for all, he was still making sure that his mother and, and John, you know, that they would look out for each other. I keep saying that, but I still don't want to look like no bum. But the mail ticket, your mic's open. Mute out. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Any, any other comments or any other uh, thing anybody else want to share from that part of the lesson? Well, I guess in our lesson, it says that the fact that Jesus addressed his mother as woman should not be construed as somehow being disrespectful. So, oh, because sometimes, my, you know, my kids will say mother, you know, and it, it's not to the point that it's disrespectful. It is just to acknowledge who that I was or I am. But sometimes it's how they say it versus when they say it. So, you know, that was a good um, thing that the commentator brought out that, you know, you know, he, how he addressed his mother wasn't being in a disrespectful manner. I mean, I, I 
like that part there. <clears throat> yeah, I think that that was mentioned um, in one of our quarters. Well, I think when we were talking about it was in the book of John, um, where Jesus was doing the miracles and uh, at, the, at the, the wedding at Canaan, uh, where, where Jesus's mother told him about, hey, they're out of wine, and he he used that word again. Um, I think they kind of explained it there too. It wasn't de derogatory. It was basically a, 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 a you know, a, and it's it's a respect in the word in a sense like I, it has here saying ma'am, where we would say yes ma'am or no ma'am. Um, so he was addressing her in a, in a different way. It wasn't in a derogatory when he said woman. All right, any other questions, any other comments? And I wanted to, because I know it wasn't in the student book, but I want to jump back to the suffering, uh, the suffering, the cross, because um, it mentioned about, it says, uh, and, and if you've watched some of the television uh, movies about uh, the crucifixion, you'll see probably two different kind. And, and here, you know, the, this part of the lesson, it wasn't in the student book, but I thought I'd share it. It says, but many believers, uh, it says, Jesus is often depicted as bearing the entire cross uh, to the place of his execution, but many believe, many believe he carried only the horizontal cross beam since it would be, have, uh, since it would have made sense to have a vertical section of the cross permanently anchored in the ground and the and at the uh, side of the crucifixion, um, and it goes on to mention Matthew's gospel related. Simon Cyrene was one of the people that was, uh, you know, basically asked to help Jesus uh, carry the cross on his way to Golgotha. But if you do some research on that, John, they say mentioned that John John's gospel was the only one that said that Jesus carried carried his cross, um, and at that time there were there were different types of crosses. Uh, one of them was, which was like a, a T a, or a capital T, which was a tool cross, which I believe it was uh, uh, one of the crosses that they used, but that wasn't the one uh, that that was that they used. It was the actual cross. It was was a Latin cross, which is the one that we wear, the one that we the one that we see, like the the lowercase T. Mm -hmm cross and that was that was all that, that was the cross that he that he bore uh that was what what as we learned that the the particular language of the uh of the uh, romans were uh, uh was pretty much latin that's they, they were under you know that latin empire in a sense that roman empire they used the latin language so that particular cross was a latin type of cross so it only makes sense. And not only that, the weight of the cross, as I mentioned, if you do some study on it, that two across weighed like 350 pounds. And that one beam would be really, really heavy for one man to carry by on his own after being beaten and, and everything uh, that, that Jesus went through. <clears throat> and then the other cross was a lot, a lot less of weight. But however, um, that was a particular cross that they use. I thought I wanted to mention that because I, um, I know we've seen some things. And again, <clears throat> what we see on TV is not all, always actual facts. So that's why we got to study and, and do some research so we can get a better understanding of what actually took place. Amen. Uh, one of the things that was interesting that was in the teacher's book, I thought Elder Bostic might have mentioned it, but it talked about Mary's sister. And, mm -hmm kind of eye-opening to me because I never, I never, that kind of slipped by, you know, slipped by me in a sense that not knowing that, uh, that James and John, the sons of Zebedee were first cousins of Jesus. Mm. According to the scriptures that, you know, the references that it gave, and I went back and looked at it and it, 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 and it was, you know, cause she was one of the ones as it stated that was at the, at the uh, place when Jesus was being crucified, you know, was, it mentioned Mary and, uh, Mary's sister and uh, uh, Mary uh, Magdalene. So but that kind of stood out. Any other questions, any other comments? If not, we're gonna go on. We might finish this up. We got 10 more minutes. Uh, mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. Hour of sacrifice, John 19, 28 through 29. As best as can be determined, Jesus was on the cross from 
about nine in the morning until about three in the afternoon. Mark 15, 25, 33, and 34. These were the very hours during which sacrifice, sacrifices were made in the temple. As the Lamb of God, Jesus was taking away from, was taking away the sins of the world from the cross uh, through the through the perfect once for all sacrifice of himself. All the prophecies related to his sacrificial death were being fulfilled during these hours of regular daily sacrifice. Indeed, all things were now accomplished, 1928. And now, I'm sorry, and knowing that all was accomplished, Jesus fulfilled one more prophecy by declaring aloud the terrible thirst uh, he experienced on the cross. Psalm 69, 21 says, they gave me also gall for my meat. And in my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. The vinegar of that era was a cheap wine vinegar commonly consumed by the soldiers. When they, when mixed, <clears throat> excuse me, when mixed with other substances, it was used as a, as an, 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 Hyssop is also known as Syrian uh, Syrian oregano. Syrian oregano, thank you. It is an herb used both as seasoning and also in religious rituals, Hebrew 919. Here it was a long branch or bunch of hyssop that had a sponge attached to it, and it was used to offer a drink to Jesus to assert, what's that? Hmm. His thirst. Perhaps even making it possible for him to forcefully make his final declaration. All right. <clears throat> yeah. Um. Oh, well, this was the this was the final, and Jesus said uh, it is finished. Once they gave him the vinegar for one. Um. Uh, Jesus had you know he knew that um he knew that he was uh he was well I'm trying to say. It. Jesus knew that he, he had come to, to do the will of the Father. So um, that you know that he would that he would die and and, and suffer these things um, to redeem God's people and to reconcile them back to him, to himself. Um, like I said, you know, about the vinegar. Um, once he received that. Um, then he cried out, you know, that it is finished. All right. Any other questions? Any comments? I have a question. Okay. At the Great. last. Got a question? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Boston. <laughs> um, at the last part where it says that as it was used to offer a drink to Jesus to assuage his thirst perhaps even making it possible for him to forcefully make a you know, decision. Was this, um, the, was, was it um, to make him confess that he wasn't the king of the Jews or gave him his final declaration that, you know, to, I mean, he, he was already hung on the cross. So was it just for that purpose or what purpose was that? You know, I, I was just a little, Overtaken by the force, make it torture. Torture. 
it, yeah. it was a torture. <clears throat> Thank yeah. you. Yeah, it's so, you know, what they were, you know, basically when he said I thirst, <clears throat> you know, um, you got to think of what he, Jesus went through in a sense, uh, the whole night uh, that day, being on the cross for six hours, um, you know, prep, prep, uh, you know, um, preparation where, you know, body, his body losing all types of bodily fluid, blood, uh, you know, very weak, um, you know, so much that he went through. And at this point, when they talk about, you know, forcefully making to make his final declaration, <clears throat> well, we always talk, we always teach or talk about the last seven sayings of Jesus. One of them was our thirst. And it wasn't like we're talking now where he said, I thirst. He probably could barely get it out um, and throat being parched and very dry. But his final declaration was to say it was, it, it is finished. And, uh, and uh, but again, you know, a lot of stuff that went on that day, you can, we can only imagine, uh, you know, what was going on at this time, <clears throat> you know, uh, and one part that, you know, it, it, it's always a kind of controversy about um, when they tried to give him gall for his meat, you know, gall, they had vinegar and gall, and that was uh, basically a numbing agent, as it said in part of here, as some type of anesthetic, anesthetic to help numb the pain. Uh, and that was something that they normally gave to those, uh, those, those, the soldiers gave those people that were being crucified to help them, you know, deal with it, uh, you know, in a sense, kind of dead in the pain. But Jesus, if you remember the first time they tried to give it, he didn't say I thirst, but they tried to give it to him and he, he didn't want it. And then at this time where he did say that he thirsts, it was a different type. It wasn't the, the vinegar mixed with gall. It was just the vinegar, which was to, like you said, to assuage his thirst uh, so he can make his final declaration. Um, but that's, yes. Uh, also, the natural vinegar that we look at, if it's anything like the vinegar that <clears throat> they used back in the day, which was more like wine, very, very tart and will dry your mouth out. Mm -hmm. So that's why I said, I believe it was more to add to the torturing that they were applying to Jesus because see, they were attacking the, the natural man. Mm -hmm. um, they, they had already uh, dethroned him as being the coming Messiah. Um, and they didn't, they didn't understand that he was sent to do just what he was going through to bear our sins, to take on the sins of the world and go through the torturing. It already said in Isaiah that he would be stricken of men. So he was just fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. And again, you know, that's why one of the things he said was, Father, forgive them because they didn't know they were doing. They didn't they know Pilate. None of them had a clue that they were fulfilling prophecy. All right. I believe. Ten any other, any other comments before we close out? Because it's 9.59, so we want to close out. All right. Um, I know the last Porsche said it is finished. So we know that the, you know, after he proclaimed it was finished, he gave up the ghost. There's nothing else need to be done. So we can't add to the cross and we can't take away. All we have to do is accept the sacrifice that God has provided for us through Jesus Christ. Amen. There's no other work need to be done. All right. We thank those for watching by Facebook. We pray that you were blessed by the lesson. Um, we join us. Um, if you'd like to be a blessing to our ministry, if you'd like to give, you can do so through the Givelify app. If you have Givelify app on tablet or computer, if not, you can go to uh, our website, www.partakerschurch.org, and uh, click on Give Now, and it will take you to the uh, Give Lify page, and you can be able to give to our ministry. We thank you in advance. And also, would like to join us this morning in worship at 4516 Beach Road in Temple Hills, Maryland. Those that are local in the metropolitan area, you're welcome to come out and join us. We are still wearing face masks and uh, social distancing. Um, so we're still trying to do what, what we need to do to stay safe. I know the numbers are going down and uh, some of the mask mandates are being changed, but we're still 
doing what we need to do to be safe. But you're welcome to come out and fellowship with us this morning at 11 o'clock. And I uh, hope to see you there. Uh, with that said, we're going to ask Deacon Edwards if he would dismiss us. All scriptures is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect and thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Amen. God bless everyone. Hope to see you at 11. Amen. Amen.